I'm Dr. Val Larson. You're listening to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. I'm excited to have Dr. Val Larson from James Madison University here on the show. Uh, Val has just recently written a bo- uh, an article in The Interpreter magazine, and it talks about Lehi and how he may not have been quite the monotheist that we typically learn in Sunday school. So he also takes aim at uh, Orthodox Christians and uh, even Steve Pineacre. So it'll be interesting to see uh, that. So you won't want to miss this conversation. Check it out. Welcome to Gospel Tangents. I'm excited to have an amazing Book of Mormon scholar. I think most of you probably haven't heard of him, but uh, could you go ahead and tell us who you are and where you teach? Okay, my name is Val Larson. Uh, I teach at James Madison University and I've been there for about 22 years. 22 years. They have a pretty good football team, I think, don't they? 1AA? Uh, Well, they just went uh, to the higher division this year. Oh, I didn't know that. And they actually were rated in the top 20. uh, Really? Their first year in the... Uh, they had they've won the national championship at the AA level. Right. They came in the, for the first year in the Sun Belt Conference, oh. and uh, they had a pretty good season. They were uh, rated like 20 or something like that for a little while before they lost a couple games. <laughs> 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 but it's pretty surprising having come from one AA level to go well, to we, the, a ranked team in your first year. We've seen Boise State do that. They did the same did thing. They? they used to be in the Big Sky, and then they went to the. Whack, I think. Well, if, if they can do anything like what Boise State has done, they'll be very happy, I'm yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, very good. So you are, I, I introduced you as a Book of Mormon expert, but you actually don't teach Book of Mormon. What do you teach? I teach marketing at James Madison University, but I had also taught English. I was an English professor. Because oh. I, I earned a PhD in English and a PhD in marketing. You've got two PhDs? Yeah. So I'm pretty well trained in the social sciences from the marketing PhD and in the humanities in the English PhD. And the more relevant one to Book of Mormon scholarship is the English PhD. It's not what I work in, but I draw on that much more heavily for Book of Mormon scholarship. Oh, nice. That's awesome. That's awesome. Where did you get your undergrad, grad, and all your PhDs from? So I... I took my undergrad, well, I started, my first year was at then Ricks College for one year. Then I had four years at BYU. I took a double major in philosophy and English, so I had two undergraduate degrees. I then went to, I worked in, uh, for 18 months as an oil field roughneck, earned money for graduate school. Oh, my. Then I, I moved to Charlottesville, Virginia, earned a master's degree, and and uh, then went into the PhD program in English there. So both those were in English. At which school? I went to uh, University of Virginia for oh, the master's you're a Wahoo. and PhD in English. But uh, while I was still working on my PhD in English, I started working as an instructor in at Virginia Tech in English. So I taught is English. Blacksburg close to? Is it Charlottesville? Charlottesville and Blacksburg, and there uh, probably two and a half hours apart from each other, three hours. Oh, wow. And uh, so I was writing dissertation. While writing dissertation, I was teaching English at Virginia Tech. And while I was there, I met a friend, uh, Noel Wright, who you've met before, who was working on a PhD in uh, marketing. And there were a lot more jobs in marketing than there were in English. I'm not surprised. And, and matter of fact, people, they were offering people like at that time $80,000 a year without even finishing their PhD, just uh, ABD, all but dissertation, without even writing a dissertation. And English jobs were hard to come by. Uh, So I actually started a marketing PhD before finishing the English PhD and, and, and started taking the classes and everything. And while I was working on the marketing PhD, I finished up and defended my dissertation in English and then went on and finished up the PhD in marketing. Which is why you teach in marketing and not right. English. Yeah. <laughs> a lot more money, a lot more job opportunities. <laughs> and James Madison, is that in Virginia? Yes. Yeah. Uh, How I far am, away from I, Blacksburg or Charlottesville? Um, it's, it's really close to the University of Virginia, just over the other side of the mountain. Matter of fact, we're in the same stake as all the University of Virginia folks are. Okay. I, I actually spent uh, some time before I went to James Madison, I went to Truman State University, which was in Missouri, and we were in the Nauvoo stake there, which was kind of fun. We'd go to uh, general con- or state conference at Nauvoo. And, uh, in the temple? 
uh, the temple wasn't, wasn't built done. there, but okay. my, it was announced. And my, uh, I was at a conference when they did the groundbreaking, but my family was all at the groundbreaking for that temple. And we moved about the time that that temple was getting completed. So uh, it was bad timing. <laughs> Wow, interesting. But yeah, we, I love Nauvoo, and it was nice living in that state for a time, but we also love uh, living in Harrisonburg or near Harrisonburg in Bridgewater, Virginia. It's beautiful. Cool. So I'm trying to remember, we met at the Book of Mormon Studies Association Conference, mm -hmm. which is, gonna, is that in Logan every year? Uh, yes, it is. Uh -huh. And so Chris Thomas, our famous Pentecostal uh, Book of Mormon scholar, um, has been the president. I think he's going to be president one more year. Uh, yes, I'm not sure how long he'll continue with it, but yeah. Yeah, I think they usually do a three-year term, but he was the guy who kicked it off, and so I think he's going to go four, and then he's... Yeah, and, and I, they like to have a uh, non-LDS person, and those are a little harder to come by than the LDS folks. <laughs> well, I think, well, rumor has it they might turn it over to an LDS guy, but... Oh, uh, is that right? Okay. Yeah, so we'll see. <laughs> Um, but you guys should come, Book of Mormon Studies Association, Utah yeah. State. I'm trying to remember what month of the year was it? It's in October. Oh, was it October? It has, has been every year I've participated, yeah. Okay. So so just make sure you guys plan on, on coming to that. It's, it's really fun. It's up in Logan. Yeah, so. it's been free, too. So, you know, what's, yeah. not, what's not to love? You can't beat the price, so. Yeah, it's great. So that was where I met you, and we had a conversation where... You blew my mind. <laughs> and so... Uh, well, it's great. I learned, I learned that we had a little bit of a connection in that you have roots, not roots exactly, but family in Moreland, Idaho, which is where I grew up. And I knew the Pilatus family there, which I think is on your mother's side. That's right. My mom's a Pilatus. Yeah. So, so the, these uh, relatives... Actually, my biggest uh, claim claim to fame is I am a second cousin once removed of President Nelson. My oh, mother really? is a second cousin to President Nelson. Oh. And his grandparents met each other when uh, his uh, grandmother was riding along on a buckboard with my uh, great grandparents. And, uh, and his grandfather came along on a horse and they kind of went along together traveling and that's how they met. So <laughs> got, well, got cool. a connection to to the pretty high uh, there you go. but I'm real low because so. <laughs> <laughs> the other prophets are Harold B. Lee from Idaho and Edward Tav Benson spent some time in Idaho and I think they well uh, uh, President Nelson didn't have any Idaho connection right but, but the, my our, our joint connection is down in Ephraim, Utah okay yeah well cool and my daughter's at Snow College so <laughs> <laughs> well cool all right well um why don't you introduce the topic to us that we're going to talk about it, because this is a Book of Mormon topic, but you had an angle on it that I had never before right. heard, and it was just fascinating. All right. So I want to frame the topic that I'm going to address today uh, by alluding to one of your good friends and a former guest, Steve Pinecker. Pinecker. Uh, Brother Pinecker is a Pentecostal who loves Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon, in part because they literally saved his life. And I'm using literally here, literally. He, his story is really interesting. And I really appreciate his charitable attitude towards Joseph Smith and the Restoration. But I've heard him say at a recent uh, Mormon history gathering, he bore testimony of the Book of Mormon somewhat as follows. I love the Book of Mormon, particularly because it doesn't have any Mormonism in it. <laughs> <laughs> and by this, he meant the Book of Mormon doesn't contain any of the distinctive doctrines of the Restoration. It's just a powerful witness of Christ and the Trinity. And since he loves Christ, what's not to like? Uh, so he's building bridges with uh, Latter-day Saints and uh, shares a lot in common with us his, uh, on, on his view. But this testimony was a playful dig at the Utah-based Restoration branches that embrace and emphasize Joseph Smith's most distinctive teachings. Steve's views are more or less entirely in harmony with the essentially Protestant Reformation branches head, headquartered east of the Mississippi. Uh, he has no real disagreements with the Community of Christ folks or Sidney Rigdon's Monongahela branch of the Restoration. He's preached in services of the Rigdonite Church uh, there in Pittsburgh, but he likes to playfully poke us Brighamites, uh, as some of the other folks call us, 
and would like to convert us to his and the Eastern Restoration branch's more orthodox Christianity because he thinks that's true Christianity. We, we try to convert people. We can't blame him for <laughs> sort of taking the view he does uh, on that. My broad thesis is that Brother Pinnaker is wrong. The Book of Mormon does contain distinctive doctrines of the Restoration that we Utah LDS regard as being both precious and true. So let's briefly talk about what some of those uh, doctrines are. Now you're ticking off all my evangelical friends who are starting to be a little bit like, oh, maybe the Book of Mormon is not too bad. Well, I, I, I told, uh, when I was talking to Steve at uh, Book of Mormon uh, Perspectives Forum, I said, he'd, he'd laid all this out and I said, you know, I don't want to steal any of your thunder with your evangel evangelical friends because he's trying to reconcile all of them to the Book of Mormon. Well, but I am. I'm kind of, <laughs> <laughs> I'm essentially undercutting his, uh, his position as he tries to sell the Book okay, of Mormon so to the evangelicals. Okay, so Steve's friends, don't listen to this Yeah, thing don't now. listen to this. This won't, this won't help uh, his uh, case. Uh, this dispensation of the gospel opens with Lehi and Joseph Smith's first visions in which a prophet initially sees a pillar of fire or light then sees the corporeal father and corporeal son. And a lot of deep doctrine is implicit in that corporeal appearance of the father and son. It suggests that God is of a kind with us rather than wholly different from us. His male body implies that we have a divine mother uh, with a female body. And the similarity of the father, mother, and son to us suggests that we can become what father, mother, and older brother are, divine beings. Both Lehi and Joseph Smith are told that contrary doctrines are an abomination in the sight of God. That's, uh, both visions use that word, abomination. And the core of the condemned abominable creed is the false idea that God is infinitely and eternally different from us. The idea that he exists outside of space and time as pure being, as, this is being with all capital letters, as the only entity that fundamentally and necessarily exists with all other things being created by him ex nihilo, out of nothing, and existing only contingently. If we accept his, uh, this, this orthodox Christian premise, it necessarily follows, as John Calvin understood and cogently argued, that everything that happens in creation happens because God willed it to be so and caused it to be so. Fiona and Terrell Givens have written that this idea of God makes God a kind of monster, a, a, as much the author of evil and damnation as of goodness and salvation, which, uh, which Calvin would basically concede, uh, not concede it, but he actually argue it. If we accept this creed, the problem of evil becomes completely intractable. Every act of evil becomes an act of God because God's outside of history and knows what every created being will do before he creates them. He has the option of creating only the subset of beings who will not choose to be monstrously evil. As the first and sufficient cause of all that exists, he can't escape responsibility for the evil that exists in the world. Of course, none of this applies to LDS theology because there's a part of us that is uncreated and uh, God uh, works with that. But it, So I'm, I'm not going to get into all that today, the, the problem of evil, but it's a big problem for Orthodox Christianity. It's really not a problem for us for some of the same reasons of the points of doctrine that I'm going to be talking about today. So wait a minute. So you're saying that, that I almost want to go with the problem of evil because so the, the because God is in charge of everything, God is in charge of evil? You say that's what Orthodox Christianity they, they, teaches? Uh, uh, Calvin, Calvin, who is a brilliant logician, conceded this whole point. Uh, the the, the, uh, the uh, Calvinists will say God created some predestined to damnation for his glory and others predestined to salvation. And it really follows logically from, from the, a couple of premises. If God is, is the cause of all things, there's nothing that exists before God acts, if God is outside of space and time, God knows everything that will happen before he ever causes it to happen. So anything that happens, happens only because God willed and caused it to be so. You, you really can't... So like Hitler happened because God willed God, God knew what Hitler was going to do before he created him. There was, Hitler was no surprise to God. See, Steve's not a Calvinist, though. He's not going to like this. Well, they... they uh, um, I'll, I'll talk... I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, 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 not about Steve, but uh, yeah, he's not a Calvinist, but the Calvinists are the most logically rigorous 
of the Orthodox Christians. Okay. So uh, it, let, me, let me just uh, go on and I'd say that it shouldn't surprise us that the loving God that hundreds of millions of Christians, Jews and Muslims and people like Steve <laughs> have known intimately reject, uh, these folks reject, uh, well, he, he, the God rejects this conception as an abomination. Uh, uh, that's not a true conception of him. Nor is it surprising that most of those believers, again, like Steve, defy logic and accurately think of their God as an inherently benign being who nurtures and blesses his children and saves all of us who are willing to be saved, who's not responsible for the evil that's in the world. So they don't think God is responsible. Uh, but the, while members of the Abrahamic religion reject the impeccable logic of Calvin, it's the logic of their own position if they would actually uh, dig into it deeply enough. Many of these Christians nevertheless insist that we have to share their conception of God to be classified as Christian. This is sort of the paradox. Their own position <laughs> makes God the cause of both all good and all evil. A lot of them don't believe that, but they do insist that we embrace their idea of God being outside of space and time. So our doctrine that our heavenly parents are of a kind with us and that through theosis we can become fully like them separates Latter-day Saint Christianity from the other branches of Christianity. And that's what motivates the common assertion that we're not Christian. Orthodox Christians may, and indeed they must, concede that the restored Church of Jesus Christ doesn't differ appreciably from their denominations in its teachings about the earthly life and saving mission of Christ. We don't differ from them on that. You're talking about Eastern Orthodox I'm Christian. talking about all of them. I'll, I'll, I'll focus on Eastern Orthodox in a moment here, but, uh, but I'm just, here I'm just talking about their understanding of the earthly mission of Christ and our understanding. If our earthly, Christ, if, if our earthly Christo Christology were the focus of their analysis, they would be obligated to classify the restored church as a Christian church. They classify it as non-Christian primarily because we reject the Trinitarian formulation of God, which is a variant of the Jewish Christian Muslim formation I was just mentioned in which God is a being outside of space and time, who is ontologically, it's a fancy word for in his being, in his essential nature, utterly different from humanity. Within this Orthodox Christianity, the Trinitarian, eternal Trinitarian God may join humanity in history incarnated as Christ, who mysteriously remains one with the Father who is outside of space and time. But humanity can never transcend its contingent existence and join God as a self-existent being, as true companions whose existence is like God's, necessary and eternal. Now that's, that's true for their theology, it isn't true for ours. And Joseph Smith uh, taught that uh, we are uncreated in our essence, and in that sense, we are uh, similar to God. We Latter-day Saints don't believe in that unbridgeable separation between God and man. We believe in theosis, human beings becoming what their divine parents are. So a distinction's in order. We use the word theosis, but we didn't invent it. Uh, the word theosis is a coinage of the Eastern Orthodoxy that, that you were just mentioning, which is by all accounts a branch of Christianity. Nobody denies that Eastern Orthodox are a branch of Christianity. In Orthodoxy, theosis denotes the beautiful, compelling idea that the proper telos, the proper end state of a contingent being is to achieve through the ministrations of Christ and the Holy Ghost, mystical union with God. And mainstream Christians don't think it's heretical to affirm that humanity may become maximally like God within the narrow confines of what's possible for a contingent being. But if, as they insist, God is the sole self-existent being who exists outside of space and time, it is heretical to affirm and logically impossible to cogently argue that contingent beings, the created creatures of the uncreated God, become, as we LDS affirm, fully like their creator. So while our LDS tradition is doctrinally closer to Eastern Orthodox Christianity than to any other branch of Christianity, we nonetheless remain very unlike them. And it's no accident that the Catholics, who are very thoughtful about these kinds of things, insist that converts from our church be rebaptized if we become Catholic. Even though on the surface, 
we meet their one requirement, that a person be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They rightly claim that the words Father, Son, and Holy Ghost don't have the same referent for us that they have for them. Again, if the referent were only the mortal ministry of Christ, there would be no difference, no, no difference between them and us. But for all of us, for them, for us, for all of us, Christ is more than just his mortal ministry. So I have a question about that because I've studied a little bit about Eastern Orthodoxy and this whole idea of theosis was just like, I mean, it's, it's very similar to the LDS idea of exaltation. And I yes. was just like, wow, because... But that's very different from Catholic Protestant yes. conceptions because that just to them seems very heretical. Well, no, they, they don't think Eastern Orthodoxy is, uh, is heretical really. There's a, the Catholics have long wanted to reunify themselves to Eastern Orthodoxy. When they, when they do ecumenical, uh, they talk about ecumenicism, that's who they care about more than anybody else. They would rather unify with the Orthodox than well, with anyone else. And I, I mean, I, I don't disagree with that. I always thought it was the Orthodox that wanted to unify with the Catholics more. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I think the Catholics would be happy to take them in at any time, but they... <laughs> the question is, what do we do with the Pope, right? <laughs> uh, well, or with the patriarchs and so forth. Right. But, but this, this tradition is precious to the Orthodox folks. But really, it's not... Uh, they're not deeply heretical in taking this position. They're saying that you can become unified with God, but you're still a contingent being. You are, you are uh, the Holy Ghost and the atonement can make you like God, but not, not like God in the sense that we were saying, where we're truly and literally and fully like God. You, you are only like God um, uh, to the extent that it's possible for a creature uh, the word creature is sort of a technical theological term. Somebody who was created doesn't have their own existence. So the, the, the thing that God's created can never become like the God that created them. Our theology is different on this point because... Homo Uzius and Homo Uzius, right? I don't want to get into all that stuff because I don't, well, I'll get it wrong though. somehow. <laughs> it relates though, I think. Because, I think it does too. Because the question, I mean, that was the big... Where the, the, the dot every I, or the, the one iota, that's where yeah, that phrase yeah, comes from. I, I, because homoi, oh, no, homo is of same substance. Yeah. Okay? Jesus and God are the same yeah, substance. Right. Whereas homoi says they're yes. different. And yeah. so my understanding is Catholics, and I would probably go with Eastern Orthodox as well, and Protestants believe God and Jesus are homo usius of the same substance. When the, but there was a... Well, actually, the, there's, I think a part of that, uh, I, I don't, I'm not an expert on, on them, but the Eastern Orthodox are a little bit different from the Catholics uh, and the they, Protestants. Are they homo, maybe? On, I think so. I think that's, that may, maybe, again, don't take my word for it. <laughs> Go talk to somebody, <laughs> the, the Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox. Because but, the, whole, the whole thing about Trinity is... Jesus is God. God is yeah. Jesus. They, they have the a Holy slightly Ghost. different view in, uh, about the relationship of the Father and the Son, and these things really matter to folks. I know, uh, and that's part of what's keeping them separate. But but I mean the, the 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 thing is with the Eastern Orthodox, if we're becoming like God, are we become are we homo usius? Are we the same, uh, or are we different? Well, because different would be no, homoi. No, no, they're they're only talking about the members of the Godhead. I know, but if we if we could become we can, we part can never, of God or uh, unified with God, yes. don't we become with God, right? Well, maybe we become with God in, in, insofar as a contingent created being could be in some sense with God. But, it's, but we're always going to be a little different. We're always, we're, we're, God was perfectly sufficient and whole and complete without us. Uh, and he created us out of nothing. And we are totally his creatures. We'll always be completely separate, infinitely separate from the being who created us. So we're going to be homoi. I don't know about the homoi. Home, that's, that. that's my take on it. <laughs> I, it's, uh, there's just a, an infinite gulf that separates the uncreated creator right. and the creations. But what Joseph Smith said is, God is uncreated, but so are we. Right. That means that's, that's, uh, that's a whole different ballgame. Yeah, but that's not at the Book of Mormon. Uh, well, I, I, true. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I'll talk about that a little bit. There's things in the Book of Mormon on uh, that that are not in, say, the King Follett discourse, which is where oh, that's that where idea came out of. Uh, that that sort of advance the distinctive LDS theology. And there's things in the King Follett discourse that aren't uh, fully in the Book of Mormon. So. Uh, you're, you're going there. Yeah. Okay. Right. Now, one other quick question. You had said that Catholics require LDS to be rebaptized. Don't they require Protestants to be baptized? No, they don't. If, if they've been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, uh, you don't have to get rebaptized. Uh, the Protestants really? are able to enter without rebaptism. I mean, it's worth noting that they don't insist that the members of the community of Christ and other Eastern branches of the Restoration be rebaptized re if they become Catholic. They just interview the convert and find out who they understand the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost to be. So Trinity is the thing where if you believe in the Trinity, you don't need to be rebaptized. If you, well, uh, yeah, you have to believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost in, in basically the Trinity. Uh, look, the, the question, uh, why do they have to interview the, the community of Christ folks? This question of who the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are is a much more open, vexed question for the community of Christ than it is for us LDS. At, at a recent meeting of the Book of Mormon Perspectives Forum, where most of the participants are community of Christ members, I asked what the community of Christ doctrine of God is. And there was this long, sort of uncomfortable pause. Then various non-definitive statements about what people personally thought. And finally, the explanation that there's no settled official doctrine. That's why the Catholics have to interview them to see if they're Trinitarian, which many and probably most, but not all of them are. Uh, there's, there's no need to interview us LDS. Our doctrine's clear and it's unacceptable to the Catholics uh, for, for understandable reasons. Uh, uh, so we, an LDS who becomes community of Christ and then wants to be Catholic, they're going to be like, oh, wait a minute, if you're, if you're too LDS. Because one of the things I love about the community of Christ, they're not correlated. So you can still have LDS God theology yes, yeah. and, be, and be a exactly. member of the community of right, Christ. Right. Or you can be Trinitarian and be the member of the community of Christ. You, or you, can, you can believe that the Book of Mormon is... Uh, is history or fiction. So, so the, the people in the Book of Mormon Perspectives Forum, they're all people who hold on to the Book of Mormon in, in a more as historical and literal in ways that their tradition doesn't anymore. That's why they kind of gathered there. It's my right. read on it. Yeah. They want to hold on to the Book of Mormon. They feel a strong kinship with us, uh, Utah LDS. Because they are more literalistic, I would say, than most Community of Christ. But, you know, they still, uh, like John Hamer totally believes it's 19th century work and they had him on like yeah they're, they're open oh they're very open I, it's a it's a great group of people and very open but this i think the the underlying driving uh rationale for the group is these folks hold on to the book of mormon in a way that the community of christ as a as an institutional body doesn't and because they're they're mostly older folks who come out of the time when the book of mormon would have been viewed uh within their faith more as a uh, historical, more as we tend to view it in the Utah branch. Right, and so let me just mention to those of you who don't know what the Book of Mormon's perspective this thing is. It's a Zoom meeting on Monday nights, 7 p.m. Mountain Time. If you're interested in joining, it's fantastic. They meet every Monday night. Um, and then just send me an email, gospeltangents at gmail.com. I will forward you a message. Um, it's really, really interesting. Yeah, it really is. And you get so many uh, different points of view on the Book of Mormon. But, but the, the core of it is a real belief in the Book of Mormon, its historicity and, uh, and its power and importance as, as uh, part of the restored gospel. Well, to get back on track, one important, <laughs> <laughs> one important thesis of my research is that theosis, man becoming fully like God, is a Book of Mormon doctrine. Oh, wow. <laughs> a doctrine that entails the existence of a divine mother who, with the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, facilitates the deification of her children. Uh, to see this, we need to understand that the Book of Mormon opens in the pivotal moment in theological history. The very moment when the theology we Latter-day Saints hold today diverges from that of Judaism, Islam, and Orthodox Christianity. This is the most important moment in, in uh, it's, not, it's not the most important moment in history, that's Christ's atonement, but it is the most important moment in theological history, the moment of what I call in some of my articles the greater apostasy, when Israel turns from the pluralistic religion of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and of, of contemporary Latter-day Saints, 
to the monistic religion that Jews, Muslims, and Orthodox Christians have today. Much more than during the great apostasy in the years following Christ, this time of Lehi, Josiah, and the Deuteronomists is when our theology diverges from that of the other Abra Abrahamic religions. It's, it's really a remarkable fact, probably, I think, a pro providential fact, that the Book of Mormon opens in this most important moment in theological history, in the very moment when our theology was diverging from what has become the dominant theology of the Abrahamic religions. So a pivotal moment, the Book of Mormon opens in such an important moment. In a moment, I'll discuss King Josiah and the Deuteronomist, Deuteronomist re reforms, talk a little bit about what they are. We can't fully discuss them today, but those who want more information and evidence could read the article I published in Square Two in 2015 entitled, Hidden in Plain View, Mother in Heaven in Scripture, and another article I published in The Interpreter in 2020 entitled, First Visions and Last Sermons, Affirming Divine Sociality, Rejecting the Greater Apostasy. Both are available online, and in the Hidden in Plain View article, I demonstrate that Mother in Heaven is pervasively present in Scripture. A quick way to illustrate this is to take the first verse and the last chapter of the Bible as indices of what we find in between. The first verse in Genesis opens as follows. Bereshit bara Elohim hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. In the beginning, the gods, the word is Elohim, the plural of the word God. So we have El, singular, Elohim, plural. The gods created the heaven and the earth. The Father doesn't stand alone. In the creation and much of what follows, it becomes apparent that he stands with the mother as Elohim. Now, now, for the last Bible chapter, anciently, the divine mother, Asherah, was signified by an almond tree trained to grow in the shape of a menorah, an apt symbol of the tree of life. They had uh, the staff that was in the, in the uh, Ark of the Covenant was uh, made of this almond, and it had, bran it had branches, so it was, that was linked to it, too. So kind of like a menorah? It, I think it was linked to the menorahs that, that were used as uh, the symbols of Asherah. We're going to see that Mother in Heaven is consistently symbolized by the Tree of Life and fountains, of, fountains or streams of pure water. In Revelation, as the Bible closes, Mother in Heaven is prominently featured in both of these symbols. The final chapter of Revelation opens as follows. And he showed me a pure river of water, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of it was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. That every month yielding of fruit is an allusion to the menstrual cycle. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Dave Butler, who I want to talk to you about later because he would be a perfect guest for your podcast. Just perfect. Uh, this is not Dave Butler, the seminary, former seminary teacher. This is Dave Butler, the lawyer, science fiction writer, uh, well-schooled in ancient uh, uh, Middle Eastern languages. Anyway, he's persuasively argued that the setting of this image in the book of Revelation is the Holy of Holies in the temple. The tree of life is there represented by the menorah. The 12 fruits are the 12 loaves of shoe bread, the bread of the presence, the food offering that's given to God. As we come to the tree of life and partake of its fruit, we eat the temple food of God uh, because the atonement cleanses and perfects us and transforms us into gods. The 12 fruits also signify the sacrament, the 12 pieces of bread given, by the apostle, uh, given to the apostles at the Last Supper. So each Sunday, as church members partake of the sacrament, they partake of the fruit of the tree of life, the bread of the presence, the last supper, which if we consume it worthily, will make us gods. Now I've just described the beginning of, the, the, of that last Bible chapter. At the end of, of that uh, chapter, the revelator sets the tree of life and the pure fountain before us one last time, says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, Blessed are they that do Christ's commandments, that they might have the right to the tree of life. Come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. So as, we see, as we're going to see, both the tree and the fountain are going to be important in the Book of Mormon as, uh, as well. So they're there in Revelation. They're going to be really important in the Book of Mormon. We'll talk about that. 
But getting back to the Bible, mother in heaven is present at both the beginning and the end of the book and many places in between. She's the alpha, uh, she's in an alpha and omega of the Bible. She joins the father and the son as the alpha and omega of scripture. I'll get into the very clear reasons we have for identifying mother with the tree of life and the fountain in a few minutes. Again, the article's hidden in plain view and it looks at the many places mother in heaven shows up in the Bible. So listeners might want to check that out if they're interested to see mother in heaven all over the place in the Bible. The article, First Visions and Last Sermons, focuses on a kinship between Lehi and Joseph Smith that's been too little noticed and too little appreciated. It's surprising, given the temporal and spatial distance that separates them, that, that these two prophets seem to have roughly the same ecclesiastical duty. They're to establish a new priesthood line, authorized to administer the gospel, build temples, and perform temple ordinances. They seem to confront roughly the same theological problem posed by uh, elites teaching roughly the same incorrect ideas about who God is. The elites in both Lehi and Joseph's time put forward a monistic conception of God. The two prophets have a pluralistic conception, uh, by contrast. Lehi and Joseph also receive their prophetic calling and are given their missions in the same way through similar first visions. And there are many thematic linkages between the prophet's last sermons. Indeed, Lehi makes his connection to Joseph Smith the main theme of his very last sermon, the blessing he gives to his son Joseph. So to reiterate, the Book of Mormon opens in the pivotal moment in theological history, when the ontology, the, the character of God, and the existence of the Divine Mother are very much in play. In Lehi's time, in, in his day, the pluralist theology is the old time religion of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that's being displaced by a new radically monist theology, ultimately understood to situate God entirely outside of space and time. This is the, this is the theology I mentioned before that jo in Joseph Smith's time had itself become the old time religion, the orthodox religion. Lehi's contemporary, King Josiah, ushered in this new monist theology. Lehi rejected it, remaining faithful to the older pluralistic theology of Abraham and the Council of Gods. Okay, so I want to stop right. there for a second because as I understand it, I remember Walter Zanger, he's a scholar of Abraham for sure, Mysteries of the Bible. I'll see if I can provide a link. One of the things that he said about Abraham was Abraham was not a monotheist. Exactly. Um, so, you know, because there's the story, uh, apparently there's a Muslim story that's very similar to our Pearl of Great Price, where Abraham goes and breaks his father's idols. Um, but the idea here with Can the Canaanite religion, and, and going back to Josiah, Israel, Israel had lots of different gods. Asherah was a female deity, Moloch, Baal, uh, Yahweh and El were actually two different I'm trying to remember. I believe it was uh, Trevin Hatch said that Josiah merged Yahweh and El. That's, that's what I'm going to be talking about too. So okay. I'm, I'm going to review a lot of these. But stuff. the point is, um, you know, like Moloch, children, if, if you go to the Bible, yeah. they, were, they were burning infants uh, to the god Moloch right. as, a, as a human sacrifice. Right. And... So we have an Asherah, there were the trees or something. I'm yeah. not, my, this is not my wheelhouse. Right. Is I'm going to talk about those things. But I, the idea here is the Canaanite deities were like Zeus and, and Jupiter. And, not, uh, 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 and not, you're, you're I'm disagreeing talk about with this that. A little bit. Yeah, I'll talk about it a little bit. Because they were polytheistic, though. Well, yeah, so, were, so was Israel. Although, uh, look, uh, the fact that it, the Israelites worshipped this pluralistic set of gods doesn't mean that all those gods were true. Uh, uh, we, I, I mean, I'm going to dig into this a little bit as I go along in, in, in our discussion, but um, like Moloch, I don't think it was true in any sense. Like we don't find anything like Moloch in the Book of Mormon. We do find Asher in the Book of Mormon. Okay. So, uh, so there's a, uh, the sacrifice, you know, Baal? what about Baal? 
Uh, but wasn't Ball the Lightning guy? But, oh, I have that right? Well, uh, all of them had various kinds of associations, some true, some false. Uh, I'll just give you my own speculation for a minute about ba Baal. Uh, Baal was a son of El and Asherah. So was Yahweh. And, but they're kind of alternative names for the same being is my read on this in part from the, so the scholarship I've read. So a lot of the animosity to Baal is driven by the fact that he is the rival of Yahweh. Right. Uh, I mean, it's like, which name are you going to use? It's like they're the, the two different side-by-side -side groups that have the same father, the same mother, but then they got these two different names. But it, I think it's more than that. Josiah is going to get rid of a son. He, there's no father and son anymore. There's only the, the, as you said, the collapsing of Yahweh and El into the one God means you've got to have a lot of animosity toward the sun God, the, the sun meaning the, the son of God. And, and Yahweh had been a son of God in this earlier religion. A son of as, 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 Abel, as had ba Baal. And so in the Josian reform, they're going to go very aggressively after the idea that there can be any other God with God. There can be no wife God. There can be no father God or, or uh, bro, so son God. So they've got to get rid of Asherah. You've got to get rid of Asherah, but you also got to get, you get rid of uh, Yahweh as the son. Now Yava is and just that's why Yava and, and El, El become the same being, okay. and you're really hostile to any representation of a son of God, because they're rejecting what was in their own tradition, uh, Yava as son, and and there's there's evidence to see that uh, you know some of them. Uh, uh, that they saw it, they saw it that way. Aren't there some other deities that I'm leaving out? Those are the only ones I can always remember. Well, I, I, I'm going to work down through a little bit. That you have the whole host of heaven, right? Uh, that, I, I'm gonna, let me let me go on because I want to talk a little bit about the the theory behind that, and I'll I'll explain it just a little bit more. So to really understand the theological issues in play in the book, when the Book of Mormon opens, you got to read the text in situ. That is in in its time with an awareness of what seems to have been happening in Jerusalem when Lehi and Sariah lived there. And we figured that out by consulting Old Testament scholarship. And we've been sort of talking about it, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit more here. So let me digress a minute and comment on, the, on studies of the Old Testament. Secular Bible scholarship, through brilliant, creative, often persuasive reasoning, has constructed a set of coherent narratives that integrate and make intelligible seemingly disparate and contradictory strands in the Old Testament. But we need to keep in mind that the evidential foundation for this scholarship is often remarkably thin, the conclusions being mostly grounded in intelligent, close reading of the text. The important Old Testament scholar Meyer Sternberg highlights the problem when he says, I'm going to quote here, the independent knowledge we possess of the real world behind the Bible remains absurdly meager. For better or worse, most of our information is culled from the Bible itself, and culling information entails a process of interpretation. There's no escaping this necessity, though again, many pretend they do. Critics often imply that they deal in hard facts. If seriously entertained, this is delusion, unquote. Now, one important implication of that statement is that the Bible, Bible study is mostly literary criticism. It's a close reading of the Bible text. It, it's not just that. Historical evidence does matter. But where historical evidence outside the Bible is so limited, any evidence that by chance survives and is discovered can dramatically change the conclusions of Bible scholars. This happened in 1928 with the discovery of the Old Testament era text at Ugarit. Those new voices speaking from the dust showed a strong kinship between the Bible religion and the religion of the surrounding Canaanites, an idea one could not have gleaned from the Bible alone. For example, it turns out, as we were talking about a minute ago, that El is the father god in both religions. He has a wife, Asherah, and, and a son, Baal, in the, in, the, and in, the, or in the Hebrew canon, as I was saying a minute ago, Yahweh. Once this was learned, it was quite evident that in the older parts of the Old Testament, the Hebrews during the time of Abraham had a very similar religion to the religion of the Canaanites. And that's what we were just talking about. Right. Now, this wasn't known when people were reading the Old Testament uh, before the discovery of some of these texts uh, at Ugarit. 
and, and a few other things that they found, they didn't really know that the Canaanite religion was so close to the, uh, the Hebrews religion. Because that's not the story the Bible's telling us. Right. It's, it's telling us that anything that comes in from the, any, any similarities that we find to the Canaanite religion, all that is apostasy and abomination and so forth. But then it turns out that, uh, that once they had dug up these things, uh, no, they had the, the same gods were operating both places. And in some ways, Old Testament scholars had kind of known this just from reading the parts of the Bible uh, uh, the Genesis, uh, uh, especially, but coming up to the time of Josiah, those older parts of the Bible had a lot of traces. Uh, the Psalms, the Proverbs, they had all kinds of traces of this older religion. And it all started to make a lot more sense as they find out, hey, you know, uh, their religion was really very similar to the religion of the Canaanites around them. Right. And this, this is actually a really important point, And I want to uh, sort of talk about it a little bit more. The, the details are going to vary from one interpreter to another because there's, the evidentiary foundation is thin. But there is broad agreement among the secular scholars that Abraham's religion can be described somewhat as follows. The high god El was an anthropomorphic being who lived in heaven in a royal court, much like the royal courts of the Middle Eastern kings at the t on earth at that time. Like the Middle Eastern kings, El governed his dominions through the ministrations of those one would typically expect to see at court. Ella, his wife, also known as Asherah, the Bene Elohim, the sons and daughters of El, noble and great heavenly servants, the Malachim, or angels, and various representatives of the divine army, the host of heaven, with El being known as the Lord of hosts. You find that title all the time. That, that title, Lord of hosts, fits with this idea that, hey, God's up there surrounded by all these heavenly hosts, the armies. And, and so these and other participants in the court were part of the governing council, the Sod Elohim, who shared to one degree or another the divinity of El and the governance of El's kingdom. So instead of, of this one being, Yahweh uh, or Elohim, out, who was outside of time and space, you've got this whole court council of divine beings. That's what was believed, okay? And, and this is not really a controversial point if you look at secular Old Testament scholars. If you look at fundamentalist Christian scholars, they're not going to believe this. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but, but the people who do academic study of the Old Testament, I haven't, they might, as I say, they might uh, quibble about who were these beings in the council and what were their names and so forth. But the, but the idea that there was a council and that the gods were considered thought of in this way, that, that's, that's sort of standard uh, Old Testament uh, idea. In this older theology, the ontology of El is not radically different from that of his wife, sons and daughters and servants. While this divine community, the Council of Gods, is obviously hierarchical, its members seem to be similar in appearance to each other and to human beings on earth. Thus, when Jacob wrestles God face to face at Peniel, now the name Peniel means face of God, so that helps, tells you who uh, Jacob was wrestling with. El is initially described as an unspecified ish. That's the Hebrew man, a, a man. A confounding of God and man that suggests that God is in form and essence, much like Jacob. Uh, God's willingness to wrestle Jacob as one man might wrestle another, likewise suggests ontological equivalence between God and his human son, Jacob. So in the time leading up to 600 BC, we have multiple corporeal gods, a theology much like LDS theology today. So I'm laying down a premise here for us to start reading the Book of Mormon. Uh, what, what did Nephi and Lehi think? Who did they understand the gods to be as the Book of Mormon opens? See, and I hate to say this because it's going to scare away a lot of evangelicals for sure, but are you saying that Nephi and Lehi were polytheists? I'm saying they believed in the religion of Abraham. <laughs> <laughs> But Abraham was a polytheist. Uh, I, um, you know, you can use the word polytheist for it, but um, like we don't, like like okay, are 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 are, are, well, are they themselves I, are they themselves polytheists? They believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now the the Jews would say to them, you and and the Muslims would too. You are polytheists. You believe in three gods. We believe in only one God. 
Both well, the Jews and the Muslims would say that, that, right? That's where the whole Trinity comes in because they're like, no, we're monotheists, but it's three gods in one. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's about, about uh, the Jews and Muslims got a pretty good argument, don't you think? Right, absolutely. <laughs> but, but even... So, so, look, part of, it, part of this is, you have to say, uh, we, we believe there's more than one being. So do, so do Orthodox Christians. And the, they believe there's one being, but there's also more than one being. So they, mu they muddle it up with... The, <laughs> the Trinity as well. Yeah, it's one and it's three and it's so. So I, I'm not going to just uh, easily concede this sort of pejorative word polytheist is on. Well, it is very pejorative. I'll agree with that. Uh, we don't need. Uh, 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 let's just say there's a divine family. Um, uh, is is the theology that is again not controversial. Uh, among Old Testament scholars. We're not, we're not off on some uh, wild speculative goose chase here with that idea. Now, before we move on to a close reading of the Book of Mormon, I want to mention one more Old Testament name of the Divine Mother, Shaddai, because it's gonna be relevant in the Book of Mormon. A great place to start in understanding who Shaddai is is the patriarchal blessing Jacob gives Joseph of Egypt. This is a passage Lehi sh surely scrutinized very closely because he's the one who fulfills part of the promise to Joseph when he runs over the wall and goes to the promised land. Uh, in the Book of Mormon, it talks about when, Joseph, when Lehi got the brass plates, he started reading in them and he found his genealogy there. And one of the things he would have been really interested in is, okay, I'm a he found he's a descendant of Joseph. And and Joseph's patriarchal blessing is contained in the brass plates. And what I'm going to be reading here is Joseph's patriarchal blessing, which talks about running over the wall. Joseph of Egypt. Joseph of Egypt, yeah, right. So the passage is found in Genesis 49. In this blessing, Jake, Jacob separately invokes El, the father, Shaddai, the mother, and Yahweh, the son or good, and good shepherd. Yava in this passage is called the mighty one, Abir in Hebrew, a term that is always and only associated with Yava in the Old Testament. So Abir, Yava, they're kind of interchangeable. In this passage, Shaddai is explicitly linked to the blessings of the breasts and of the womb. So, quote, Joseph is a fruitful bough whose branches run over the wall. Again, there's that allusion to Lehi going over the wall as he goes to the promised land. His hands were made strong by the mighty one of Jacob. The word here is Abir, it's always Yava. And then it goes on, from thence the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Well, who's the good shepherd? Who's the stone of Israel? We, uh, uh, that, for us Christians, um, that's, uh, that's all really clear. Um, and, and, then it, and then it says, uh, even by El, now the, it says even by God, but it's translating El, El who shall, uh, help thee, and by Shaddai. Now, the King James Version says Almighty here, but it's translating the word Shaddai. Who shall bless thee with the blessings of the breasts, Shaddaiim, uh, and of the womb, unquote. The important, uh, imp important meanings in this passage are expressed through wordplay. The ones I'm going to focus on here are Shaddai being connected to Shaddaiim. Uh, so Shaddai, the, uh, this God being connected to Shaddaiim breasts, suggesting a God with breasts or a goddess. Uh, now, in the King James Version, Shaddai is always translated Almighty. Every time the word Almighty shows up, it's Shaddai. In that translation as Almighty is conjectural. They're, they're guessing, the scholars are guessing. It's based on the assumption that Shaddai is related to the word Shaddad, meaning destroyer or plunderer. But this name of God always shows up, as it does in Joseph's blessing, in contexts where birth and fertility are in play. For example, it first appears when 99-year-old Abraham and Sariah are promised that despite Sariah's old age, they'll have a son and great posterity. Other appearances are similar. So the connection between Shaddai, the God, and Shaddaiim breasts with this being, the Divine Mother, is more plausible than the translation destroyer. And I focus on this Divine Mother translation because the word Almighty, Shaddai in Hebrew, is going to be important in Lehi's first vision. So I, that's why I wanted to focus on it. The opening of the Book of Mormon, it's going to show up there uh, in an important uh, place. 
Let me say a bit more about Old Testament names. The ontological equality of God and man is crystallized in what secular scholars call divine kinsman theology, the idea that human beings have a kind of blood relationship with God. Some biblical names reflect this uh, theology. Uh, human kinship with the Father is reflected in the name Abiel. So you have Ab, Father, and then El, God. So, uh, so it translates as El is my Father. Human kinship with the Son is reflected in Ahijah, which translates uh, Yahweh is my brother. So you got, uh, you got Yah in, at the end of it and uh, Ahi, the, the brothers uh, being combined there. Uh, uh, Yahweh is my brother. Human kinship with the Divine Mother is reflected in the name Amishadai, which translates Shaddai is my kin or the people of Shaddai. So leading up to the time of Lehi, Israel had this theology in which there was a father god, El, a mother god, Ella, Asherah, Shaddai, different names, and a son god, Yahweh. But while Lehi lived in Jerusalem, the theology of Israel changed dramatically. During the, during the renovation of the temple, Hilkiah, the high priest, found, or some think wrote, because it greatly enhanced the power of the priest. Uh, everything had to be focused on the temple in Jerusalem. The first uh, forgery of the Bible, potentially. <laughs> anyway, uh, it, 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 he, he found this book called the Book of the Law, which many scholars believe to be part of the current book of Deuteronomy. The book condemned Israel for worshiping the gods of the Sod. The, the divine council. It predicted that Josiah's kingdom would be destroyed because the people did not strictly keep the law of Moses and worship Yahweh alone. Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan the scribe who accompanied by some other scribes, Ahikam, Akbor, Asahiah, carried it to King Josiah. Upon hearing the book's content, the king rent his clothes, then initiated a violent theological reform. These are called the Deuteronomist reforms because they're sort of prompted by this discovery of Deuteronomy. Now, in, the, in a multidimensional push to centralize theology, ritual, worship, and governance, Josiah took things in hand. The Jerusalem temple was full of things associated with members of the divine council, the Sod Elohim. He destroyed them. He dragged the Asherah, a mother in heaven statue, in the temple for at least 236 of its 370 years down into the Kidron Valley and he burned it. He destroyed all the ancient temples and sacred groves in the high places, Shechem, Bethel, where the patriarchs had worshiped the gods of the divine council. As Deuteronomy 12, 19 required, he centralized all public ritual in one place, Jerusalem, which made Hilkiah happy because he was the high priest there, uh, where he could oversee it and control it. As Deuteronomy 3, uh, 1 through 11 mandated, he killed all the priests who facilitated the worship of divine council members and all the prophets who taught that there was any God with God. There's a non-trivial, connecting this to the Book of Mormon, there's a non-trivial possibility he killed Zenos and Zenic. Zenic taught that there was a God with God, a, a Ben Elohim, a son of God, who would come down to redeem humanity from their sins. Zenos taught that and also emphasized the importance of humanity being closely rather than distantly connected to the mother tree. Um, if Josiah didn't kill Zenos and Zenic, he would have if they'd been alive teaching uh, these things during his reign uh, uh, that the Book of Mormon tells us that they did teach. Now, this theological revolution replaced the corporeal, pluralistic, divine kinsman of the Sod, the Council of Gods, with a solitary sovereign that transcended uh, the transcendent one God, Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh and Elohim, or, as you were suggesting, collapsed into this one being. The reasoning behind this change may be that May, may have been rooted in a perceived linkage between God's name and the Hebrew verb to be, uh, which yields a sophisticated reasoning, a reading of, of Moses' first encounter with God in Exodus. There, Yahweh declares that his name is Eya Asher Eya, I am that I am. This name statement can be read philosophically as saying that Yahweh is pure being. I'm, again, capital be, uh, being, being as such the only thing that exists in and of itself. Speaking in the first person, God says, Eya, I am, and reveals his unique status as pure being. Speaking of God in the third person, we say, Yahweh, he is. So we refer to God, 
the great I am as Yahweh, he is. And we may think of him as the one and only thing that purely self-existently is. This mon monistic way of thinking about God as pure being, as the ground of all being, makes him abstract, transcendent, prior to and separate from all created things. So that gets us to the God of contemporary Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Uh, it's, uh, so, so, Lee, so this is what's emerging in that moment. And I mean, Jews are so brilliant. You can see them <laughs> figuring something like this out, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's philosophically genius uh, what's going on here. But it is a big change. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a big change that everybody's going to build on from that time. Um, it's going to be the reason that Christ gets rejected. Um, <laughs> he's not, he doesn't fit with this idea, right? Uh, in, in the Meridian time, he's coming along and he's not a, a follower of Josiah. He's contradicting stuff. And everybody that's around him, the Jews at that time are followers of Josiah. They believe in, in this change that's made at that moment. Lehi seems to elude and deprecate this new monist theology when in a very philosophical, metaphysical passage, he asserts the need for opposition in all things, that all things must be a compound, that pure oneness is nihilistic, because if it should be one body, it must remain as dead, having no life, neither death, nor corruption, nor incorruption. Without plurality, Lehi says, there is no God. And if there's no God, we are not neither the earth, wherefore all things must have vanished away. For Lehi, a monist metaphysics, like that of Josiah is nihilistic and fundamentally false. My point here is related to one Paul Toscano made in his interview with you, where he says that God must be a compound of male and female. Of course, Paul then views this compound God as the first mover God, not, as, not all that different from the God of Orthodox Christianity. So in that sense, he's an Orthodox Christian, not a heretical Latter-day Saint like we are. <laughs> but as Paul and I both emphasize, Lehi is arguing against monism here. So in, in one of my articles, I do dig into this more deeply, but basically uh, the premise is Lehi had some people in mind when he had that uh, opposition in all things uh, sermon that he's giving to Jacob. He's, it's, he's giving it to Jacob and he's arguing with someone. This isn't coming out of nowhere. This is coming out of, hey, uh, Josiah is saying there's, there is just one. Everything collapses down into this one being outside of space and time. Lehi says, uh, everything disappears. You got, God disappears, everything disappears if you, if you believe in that kind of uh, fundamental oneness. So Lehi is not on board <laughs> with what's going on in this, uh, in this revolution. Uh, the person Lehi was speaking to as he made this philosophical statement or argument was his son Jacob. And Jacob also seems to allude to and deprecate this change from a pluralist to a monist theology. In his introduction to the martyr Zenos's allegory of the olive, and it isn't just Zenos, uh, what we get here is the, the account as Zenos gave it, but Lehi had the same teaching. It, it tells that Lehi taught about the allegory of the, uh, of the tree. Uh, it, so we get the account from, um, from Zenos but, and, and Jacob, but Lehi taught the same thing. Anyway, in, in this uh, allegory of the olive, God portrays himself as a social being working with other similar beings. Um, and uh, it's God and he's got this uh, servant who's with him and all the other laborers and so forth. That's, that's the older Old Testament God. That's not the one God that's all, all by himself. I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, read what Jacob wrote as he, as he was as an introduction to the allegory of the olive tree. So you're saying the olive tree, because normally when we talk about the olive tree, it's like, oh, well, he's grafting in the Gentiles into the tree and we're bringing in Israel and the Gentiles together. But you're saying there's a different uh, message in this. Well, it, the, it's described five times as the mother tree. And all humanity is connected to this mother tree. And the apostasy that happens, happens because the elites have become too distant. It says the, the tops of the branches are disconnected from the root, which when is good. When you're talking about the elites, you're talking about Josiah. Well, yes, and uh, yeah, the, uh, that, yes, that, that would be fit here, certainly. Uh, so so the, mother, the mother tree, what's the mother tree? Divine mother, as I'm going to argue going through Asherah. this. Asherah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and... Uh, 
and the apostasy that's taking place is it says the uh, the, bran- the the tops of the branches take power to themselves and they, they go wild. The they start to stop being connected to the trunk. And I'll mention a little bit earlier that Asherah was represented as uh, in various ways. That you have the menorah, which was uh, a an almond tree trained to grow to look like a menorah. So that's what the Asherah cold object looked like. Uh, oh, really? Was a was a tree of life. So uh, so they were a tree of life like the menorah. Yes, the menorah. The menorah is a residual Asherah in the temple is is the argument here. Anyway, uh, so let me read Jacob's introduction. I'm going to put in some little interpolations here to connect it to what we've been talking about. So Jake, this is Jacob's introduction to the the allegory of the olive. Josiah's Jerusalem. Okay, this is jo- jo- Josiah's Jerusalem Jews. He just says Jews. <laughs> I'm throwing the <laughs> Josiah's Jerusalem. Josiah's Jerusalem Jews were a stiff-necked people, and they despised the words of plainness and killed the prophets, Zenos and Zenoch, for instance, uh, and sought for things they could not understand. What were they? What, what was it that they couldn't? A radically other, solitary God outside of space and time. It's a lot harder to understand than what they had be, uh, understood before. Wherefore, because of their blindness, which blindness came by looking beyond the mark. Looking beyond the mark means you're going way beyond something sort of obvious to something less obvious, right? Uh, uh, what, you're going from polytheism to monotheism. You're going from gods with a form like us. Uh, anyway, they're going beyond the mark. Gods in a form like us that are easy to understand. Uh, they must needs fall, for God hath taken away his plainness from them. What's the plainness? The divine family, father, mother, and son. That's a lot plainer than a solitary sovereign outside of space and time uh, that is the first mover. You know, it's, that's, that's not nearly as plain as, <laughs> as what they had believed. And I think that's what uh, he's... Uh, and, and, and because they've looked beyond the mark, they must needs fall. For God hath taken away his plainness from them, this divine family, and delivered unto them many things which they cannot understand. A solitary sovereign outside of time and space, three beings in one, right? That is, it has, everybody concedes, look, God is completely other. There's no, there, we have no categories for getting at who God is. Jacob's saying, that's not, you're looking beyond the mark here. Uh, that brilliant, that brilliant Jewish reasoning, they're so smart, went a little too far here. <laughs> anyway. Uh, another way of looking beyond the mark would be like the Trinity. <laughs> exactly, right. Okay. But, but, but the, trim, the Trinity is the effort to uh, fit. When, when Christ came, Christ didn't fit with this, right? right. The one God, there's a God without any other beings with him. How do you fit Christ into that? Uh, that was a big problem, and, and the Jews had good reason for rejecting Christ, right? This is who they believed in. Right. They, they believed they got away from this idea of more than one uh, being. And so now Christ comes along and says, yeah, I'm, I and my Father, uh, 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 I'm, I'm uh, with the Father, the Father's father with me. There's a God with God, right? Yeah. We're, back to, we're back to the, the uh, pre-Josian idea that, hey, we have a Father God and we've got a Son God. That... that that's a problem. That's a big problem. It was a problem for the, uh, for the Aristotelians too, right? So you had this uh, beautiful uh, philosophy of Aristotle uh, about the first mover God, the uncreated first mover God from which everything came out of. So, so that, that kind of converged with the Josian solitary sovereign. You had both those two things. And then the Trinity, the Trinitarian idea kind of puts those th- two things together. You find a way to get the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost shoved into monotheism, uh, into monotheism and into, but it also into Aristotle's uh, version of monotheism. So a- Aristotle had two, two possible uh, explanations for the beginning. One was uh, this unmoved mover God that was outside of time and space. And, uh, and then the other possibility was everything had just always existed. And the philosophers all wanted to go with the unmoved mover because it's a lot sort of cleaner than having th- things always exist. Our theology is more on the other side with the Arist- Aristotelians, other possibility too. So uh, with, with both Aristotle, we kind of go down his other path. Uh, and on the theology, we, st- we stick with the Abraham, older Abrahamic stuff, rather than going with this new, sophisticated, uh, brilliant idea, but uh, false idea. <laughs> because again, again, 
there's no way to acquit God of all evil. If, if you follow the logic of this thing out, everything that's made comes out of him. He knows what's going to happen ahead of time. How do you ever absolve him of responsible for, responsibility for Hitler? People will say, well, freedom. Uh, we, we, he gave uh, Hitler freedom and Hitler chose to do this thing. Yeah, but God can create only that subset of free beings who don't choose to do monstrously evil things. He knew what Hitler was going to do before Hitler ever did it. So how do you get him off the hook from that? It, that's... But anyway, we're not going to talk about the problem of evil today, but Joseph Smith made huge advances on that. I mean, we, we Latter-day Saints escape a lot of problems uh, because of this fundamental change in theology. It's, it's one of the beauties of LDS theology. Sterling McMurrin actually commented on this and kind of like this about uh, LDS theology. Anyway, so we get uh, we end up getting this uh, solitary sovereign uh, that's emerged, which both Lehi and, Joseph and uh, Jacob are rejecting. Okay, so Lehi's son Nephi also alludes to and deprecates this change to a monist theology as he opens the Book of Mormon with the first vision experience, uh, which is going to involve the receipt of a book, right? Keep in mind, how did Josiah's thing start? Started with him receiving a book. Uh, Deuteronomy. Well, the first vision is going to start with the receiving a book. So uh, these two things parallel. It's going to parallel the experience of receiving the book of the law of the Lord that motivated Josiah to initiate his Deuteronomous purge of the gods of the sowed and those who believed in them. He got rid of, he got rid of the gods. He got rid of the people that believed in him as much as he could do. All Nephi's parallels between Lehi and Josiah seem calculated to discredit Josiah and his reform. They discredit them by having obviously superior theological provenance. They come from a, a more sacred place and diametrically opposite theological meaning. So the initial location of Josiah's book is the temple, the house of God on earth, where the mercy seat, God's uh, symbolic throne is located. That's where Deuteron or the book of the law of the Lord was uh, discovered. Relatedly, but also conversely, the initial location of Lehi's book is in heaven, the place the earthly temple merely symbolizes, where the actual throne of God and God himself are located. Hilkiah, the human high priest, chief administrator of the temple, finds the book and sends it to Josiah. El Elyon, the most high God, the divine high priest who sits upon the throne in heaven and administers heaven and earth, sends the book to Lehi. So Hilkiah, you want to receive your book from Hilkiah or do you want to receive it from God? <laughs> Those are the two that are sending these books forward. Uh, Hilkiah gives the book to Shaphan, the scribe who carries it to Josiah, accompanied by other scribes. These scribes bearing and reading texts mark the advent of a text-centered, Sophic, rabbinic religion that will reject Jesus, God with God, when he comes in, in the meridian of time. Uh, and I say here, uh, some, of the, some of the scholars will say, this is the beginning of rabbinic text-based uh, religion because the, uh, the texts are starting to be settled here around this time. And so you start to get the... Which is what leads to the Pharisees? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, it's, it's kind of a beginning for that uh, where you have these authoritative texts and, and Josiah is interpreting the text. I mean, they're really focusing in on the law of Moses and, and getting to the text and following the text. That is all getting its start right here in this moment, uh, as uh, what some of the scholars will tell you. Uh, uh, so, so Hilkiah gives the book uh, and sends it with the scribes to, uh, to uh, Josiah. El Elyon gives the book to Jesus, Yahweh and uh, the son of God who carries it to Lehi accompanied by 12 hosts of heaven. So this divine son and his apostle companions anticipate, anticipate the advent of the mantic revelatory religion which they will preach in the meridian of time. Josiah's book prophesies that Jerusalem will be destroyed because it believes in and worships other gods with God. Lehi's book prophesies that Jerusalem will be destroyed because it fails to worship God with God the Messiah who will come to redeem Israel and the whole world and who works side by side in heaven and on earth with his divine father, mother, Holy Ghost, and all the heavenly host. So Nephi is actually setting this up when he opens with that vision of, of a guy receiving a book and that 
telling him what was going on wrong with Jerusalem. That is a point counterpoint with Josiah receiving his book that sets all of uh, Orthodox Christianity, Judaism, and Islam on this course to believe in the God outside of space and time. So when I say, that's why I'm saying this is the, the moment in theology, you know, it's, it's when we went from having the, the gods that we believe in in the LDS church to having this God everybody else believes in <laughs> that we're, we're separated from. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Val Larson. In our next conversation, we're going to talk about the great and spacious building. Val has a very surprising interpretation. Uh, Dave Butler offers several reasons for thinking that this, this great building is the temple. The fact that the building is high in the air. Wait, wait, wait. The great and spacious building? Yes, is the temple. Is the temple? Yes. Thanks for listening to Gospel Tangents. If you'd like to support me, please subscribe at gospeltangents.com or on patreon.com slash gospeltangents, or you can watch entire videos at youtube.com slash gospeltangents. I really can't do this without your support. I'd love to do it full time, and I need a lot more people that are willing to, to help me out. So I'd really appreciate that. So thanks again for listening, and don't forget to check out some of our other videos.